Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Well, if you've got your Bible with you this morning, I want to encourage you to go ahead and grab that out if you would. If you don't have one, there's one underneath the chair right there in front of you. We're in the middle of a sermon series called Start Here. So it's this idea of maybe if you're new to Christ or even if you've fallen for a long time, think, how could I be more Christ-like? What do I need to change in my life to keep growing as a believer? Well, this passage, what we're looking at today, is a part of that sermon series that says, start here. It's the idea of the Beatitudes. So we're in the book of Matthew. It's Matthew chapter 5. So go ahead and open that up and hold that right there. Well, this week, if you've got a kid or if you know a kid, then somehow you probably experienced graduation on some level. So if you didn't know, this graduation is pretty much for every grade, right? There's like a two-year-old graduation, a preschool graduation, you got kinder school, you got fifth grade, eighth grade, high school, and college. So if you've got a kid somewhere in that boat, you were probably close to a graduation. Uh, for us, Joe and I, my wife, we were asked to MC a graduation downtown. And so I went downtown to First Baptist Church. It was a homeschool graduation. So if you've ever wondered, do homeschool students graduate? The answer is yes, they do. They do graduate. And so we were MCing this graduation, uh, just doing the introductions, uh, telling a few jokes, just having fun with them, and then we were supposed to read the names as the students graduated and walked across the stage. So Friday night, I go down for rehearsal, and I'm reading these 25 names and their bios. And I did pretty good on the pronunciation. I tried on the names and read the bio as best I could. And as soon as we got done with rehearsal, about five sets of parents ran right up to me, said, hey, we need to make a few changes. They're no longer going to that school, or she's changed her mind, she's doing this. And so I did my best to take those notes Went home that night and kind of retyped up the script and made those changes the best I could. Well, Saturday came, the day of graduation, and I didn't know, but I had made some major mistakes as I corrected some of these. And so I'm reading the names, and this girl comes across, and I read that she's going to go to Wayland Baptist University in Plainview, Texas. And she just stops looking, and is like, nope, that's wrong, and never heard of it kind of thing. And I didn't know what to do, so I keep reading. I said, and she loves animals. And she's walking across the stage like, no, I don't. <laughs> and then she keeps going. I said, she plans to work with animals after graduation. She's just like, no. Takes her paper and just kind of walks off the stage. I thought, man, I, I, I don't know what happened. I mean, that fit nobody there. So I'd have no idea where that description came from. Well, right after the, the graduation, you can imagine her mom and dad made a beeline. I mean, here they come, right down the aisle. I'm like, I am in trouble. This is not going to be good. And they're like, we got to admit, she cried for a second or two when she sat down. But we just want you to know that we forgive you, and it's going to be okay. Because actually, we had a good laugh, and now we realize we'll never forget her graduation, thanks to you. And so that family showed me, they showed me mercy. They had every right to chew me out or say, man, you messed up, slap me upside the head, whatever they wanted to do. But they showed me mercy. So as we talk about this idea of mercy, when you, give, when you have the opportunity, do you show mercy to other people around you? And so in Matthew chapter 5, as we read this in just a second, I want to tell you one other thing. When I was in Cincinnati, the first full-time church staff position I had, do you ever take a job and then you find out there's more to the job than what they told you when you said yes? It's one of those kind of things. Well, I've been there for a few months, and literally the staff looked at me and said, Tommy, you have to be Jesus. Like, wow. Okay, you know, that's a pretty big, tall order to be Jesus, right? I said, what do you mean by that? He's like, yeah, I want to be Christ-like. I said, no, seriously, you have to be Jesus in this year's Easter play. Oh, okay, act like Jesus, I get it. So I didn't know what that meant, but basically this was the biggest event this church did. This church ran about 250 people. And on the week of the Easter play, and it was a week-long play, we'd have 1,500 people come through and see this play. So basically what you're telling me is I get to hang on a cross in a diaper for a week of my life. Yes, that's what I get to do to play Jesus. But as a part of that, I had to memorize some scripture. I had to memorize this passage right here, chapter 5, 6, and 7, what's called the Sermon on the mount because during the play i'd walk around like i'd come down here and i'd i'd have to talk to you guys for like five minutes then i'd go over here and i'd talk to these guys for like five minutes 
And I come over here, and while something was happening here, I had to like basically fill 20, 25 minutes of dialogue with the crowd. You know, when you play Jesus, you just can't make junk up, right? You can't just tell jokes like, hey, man, you hear about the two Pharisees? Yeah, man, they walked into a bar, came out Sadducees. You can't do that, right? You actually have to say things that Jesus would have said. And so as I memorized the scripture, I realized, you know what? This first nine, ten verses called the Beatitudes, this would be the one passage I would say, if you're going to memorize anything and you want to be Christ-like, these are the verses that I would encourage you to commit to memory. Things like, blessed are those who mourn. Right? Blessed are the meek. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. And today, as you look at verse 7, take your Bible there, Matthew chapter 5, verse 7. It simply says, Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Let's pray real quick. Father, we do thank you for just a chance to open up your word and freely speak and teach and hopefully, God, hear from you today as your children. And God, above all, we know that we need mercy. We need to know that we need to show mercy to others in our life. So help us to understand that and live that out the best that we can. Thank you, Father, for which name we pray. And everybody said? All right, so this idea of mercy, what's it mean? Well, today we're going to look at two things. I want you to be able to answer these two questions when you leave. Question number one simply says, what is mercy? So I want you to have a good definition. Somebody asks you, say, what's the Bible teach on mercy? I want you to be able to give them a great definition of what it means to show mercy or have mercy. What's that word mean? Number two is, then how do you go out and do that? How do I go out there and hang out with my family this weekend? People come over to my house, or maybe we're going to their house, you know, today, tonight, or maybe tomorrow, or go back to work on Tuesday. How do I show mercy to other people? Well, let's start off with what it means. So Old Testament, Hebrew words for mercy. These are the definitions of how the word is used. Kaporis, it simply means ransom, vegetatory, or the mercy seat. There's been a debt. Somebody's got to pay it, somebody comes, and they take it away. Raka means to love, to have compassion, to show mercy. Chesed means goodness, kindness, mercifulness, or loving kindness. I've done something wrong, I've wronged you, somebody has to pay that, or it has to be forgiven. I need to be shown mercy so I can move forward. Those are Old Testament. How about New Testament? New Testament says this, Greek words for mercy. Leman means to show mercy, to have pity, to have compassion, to be merciful. Orchitimus, it means the, the concept of compassion or pity. So it's this idea, man, I, I felt pity for that guy. I'm going I'm to give him mercy. He deserves a second chance. Now those definitions probably mean nothing to you, so let's put it into a picture. What would a picture look like, a picture of mercy? So for you cat lovers, here's a picture of mercy. It says, oh Lord, have mercy on me. All right, so this cat's done something wrong. Eat the family mouse or something, but he's praying. Lord, have mercy on me on me. This is what we think of we think of mercy. We've done something wrong. We're begging to our parents. We're begging to our boss saying, give me another chance. Have mercy on me. Well, speaking of having no mercy, birds have no mercy. Pigeons have none. That poor kid, that's just a bad day, isn't it? I don't know if y'all can see, but that bird's doing his business on that little boy. That's not right. Mercy, pigeons have none. The picture that comes to my mind, though, about mercy is this picture. Are there any men in the room? Come on, fellas. Gladiator. This is as good as it gets for me right here, right? Picture of mercy. This is Maximus from the movie Gladiator. Maximus was the general of the armies, right? The new emperor, the, the bad guy, takes over, tries to kill him. He's sold as a slave, ends up as a gladiator. Now he's fighting his way back up the food chain. And in this particular scene, he has just defeated a champion of champions of gladiators. The guy is wounded, laying at his feet. He's got his blade. He's waiting. Do I chop his head off or do I let him live? Well, if you've seen the movie, then you know the emperor does this thing right here. What does that mean? Live. What does that mean? That means chop his head off. That means take him out. Show no mercy. Well, if you know the movie, the emperor actually says what? Kill him. But Maximus says, no, I'm going to let him live. And he's known as Maximus the merciful. So what about you? Are you merciful or are you more like judgment? So as we talk about mercy, here's our definition for the word mercy. So just as a little reminder for my sake, mercy. So mercy is not getting the punishment you deserve. Read that with me. It says, mercy is not getting the punishment you deserve. You got to read a little louder, please. 
Mercy is not getting the punishment you deserve. All right, good. What's the other side then of mercy? What's the other side? Justice, right? Judgment. So on the other side here of the coin, or other side of the stage, if you will, we have this idea of what's called justice. And somewhere between these guys, you live. I don't know if you knew that or not, but you live somewhere between these two characteristics. And the person next to you, go ahead and tell them, are they more merciful or are they more like judgment? Go ahead and tell them. It's okay. Which one are they like? Which one are you like? Are you like closer to mercy or do you like closer to Man, if somebody owes me something, they're going to pay it back or I'm going to hurt them. Or I'm not forgiving anyone. I'm always going to show judgment. Now, when Jesus said this thing on the hillside, when he said, everybody sit down, the crowds came to him, began to teach him, saying, blessed are those. He said, blessed are the merciful. You've got to realize this is where everybody's sitting. They're sitting right here. They live in a world of justice. That gladiator, that's Roman times. That's when Jesus was here. A Roman soldier... If he showed mercy, that was a sign of weakness. You don't show mercy to people. If you're a business owner at that day, someone's wronged you, you don't show mercy. They live right here with justice. This is where they lived. And for Jesus to stand up on that hillside and say, blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy, that didn't make any sense because this is where they lived. So where do you live with this idea of mercy or justice? Justice is getting the punishment you deserve. So mercy is not getting it. Justice is getting it. And you're on one of these two scales. And Jesus is saying today, I want to challenge you to think about if this is where you live, I'd like to see you come over here and be a little bit more merciful in your life. I want to tell you three stories. One's from the Old Testament. One's from the New Testament. And one's from my life. If you know some of the Bible, then you've probably heard of a king named David. David is one of the most famous kings in the in the Bible, but I want to imagine one day that David is having a conversation with his son Solomon, and it went something like this. Like, son, Solomon, just have a seat. I want to talk to you for a second. Just, just sit down. No, I'm not going to tell you how I killed Goliath again, but I will if you want me to. No, I'm not going to do that. Listen, just, just sit down. I need to talk to you about something that's important. It's on my heart. I want to talk to you about this idea of mercy and what it's meant to me and Someday you could be the king, and son, I just want you to know this is important, so if you'll just hear me out, I just need to get this off my chest. You remember Grandpa, right? Grandpa Jesse, you remember Jesse? Well, uh, when the prophet came to our house, I was just a kid, and I don't know if I told you this, but he chose me to be king when I was just a little boy. He, he anointed the, the oil on my head and said, I'm going to be king someday, but son, I waited 22 years before I actually became the king. I had to wait 22 years for that promise to come true, and well, during that time, you... I told you something about King Saul, and you know, King Saul was a wicked man. He, he did some good, but in the end, he, he'd really lost his mind. And on a sudden, he tried to kill me. He was trying to kill me for years. And he would chase me, and I would hide, and my men would defeat and defend me, and then he'd chase us again. And, well, son, I want you to know, twice, two times, I had the chance to kill Saul. Two times. My men were there. They had their weapons. We could have killed him. It would have been easy. We could have snuck away. But two times we had a chance to kill the king. But man, something inside just said, I cannot touch the Lord's anointed. I need to show mercy to this man. Even if he doesn't deserve it, I need to show him mercy. Well, son, I didn't realize, but later in life, I'd be on the other side of that coin, and I would need mercy. He said, son, I want to tell you the truth about your mother. I don't know if she's told you, but I want you to hear it from my side of the story about your mother. I was the king, and it was a season when kings were supposed to be out to war, and I didn't go. I wasn't close to God, and I was doing my own thing. And son, I was just selfish. I was in the wrong when I stayed home. And one day, I'm taking a walk up on the roof, and I see your mom. First time I've seen her, she was beautiful. She was bathing. I could see. And son, I thought, I'm the king. I can have any food I want. I can have any entertainment I want. Why can't I have that woman. And I did. I called for her to be brought to my house and, son, I committed adultery. I don't know if you know this, son, but you actually had an older brother. She became pregnant. It got worse because I tried to cover it up. I sent her back to her house. I ordered for her husband, Uriah. He was a good man. Uriah, he was a better man than I was. I sent for him to come back. 
I was hoping he'd go be at the house so it wouldn't look so bad, but you know that man, he wouldn't even go in his own home because he was still on active duty as a soldier. Son, I had to write a note and give to Uriah that he took back to my commander to have him murdered. Tried to cover it up. I said, put him on the front lines, have everybody draw back, and just make sure that he is killed in the line of duty. And he was, he was killed. And son, his blood's on my hands. I thought it was over and the baby was born and the baby died. It was the lowest point of my life that I can remember, son. I thought maybe nobody knew, but then, as God does, he sent another prophet. I don't know if you know Uncle Nate, but Nathan, he was a prophet, and Uncle Nate came, and he's telling me this story about these two guys. One of them had all these sheep, hundreds of lambs, and the other guy, he's got one, one, but then the rich guy was going to throw a party, and what's he do? He went and took the lamb from the one guy. It was like family to him. He took that lamb, Solomon, and he took it, and he killed it, and that's what he used to throw his party with. Then he looked at me, the king, and said, King, what would you do to that man to punish that man? And I said, oh, man, I would punish him. I'd punish his family. I'd punish him strong. I'd have that man pay with his life. But I never forget, son, what Uncle Nate or Nathan said to me. He pointed to me and said, son, said, David, you're the man. You're the man. That's what you've done. You had all this stuff, but yet you went and took the one that wasn't yours. You know, son, I write these things down, like poems, songs. Maybe you can call them psalms if you want to later, but I write these things down and hoping that people will learn lessons from my mistakes. And Well, son, I want to read this letter to you. This is from Psalm 51. It's a letter I wrote as I was repenting to God about having mercy on me. I said, God, have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love. According to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions. Wash away all my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is always before me. I ask God to create in me a clean heart, a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. Son, I tell you this because it's important to show mercy to others because one day you're going to be the king here and you're going to deal with a lot of people and you need to be able to show mercy because one day you're going to need people to show you mercy and you're going to need God to show you mercy. Son, one other thing. You know, I've got a couple wives here and let me tell you something, son. If you can do this, just get one wife. So I'll just have one wife, life would be much better, right? That's all I got for you. Thank you. Second story comes from the New Testament. A story Jesus told in chapter 18. And so Jesus, the disciples were asking him, how many times, by the way, do we need to forgive people? How about seven? Seven times? Jesus says, no, 70 times seven. So let me tell you a story, Jesus says. He says, there was a king, and this king was collecting the people who owed him debts. He's collecting them in, said, it's time to pay up. And so he brought the first guy in. The first guy owed him 10,000 talents. That's the equivalent of a couple million dollars. That's a lot of money. If you're in debt a couple million dollars, that's a pretty big deal, right? And the king says, I tell you what, I'm going to throw you in prison. I'm going to sell your wife. I'm going to sell your kids. We're going to sell everything you got until you can pay me back the money that you owe me. We can imagine the guy fell down on his knees, right, begging for his life. Oh, king, please have mercy on me. Oh, kitty cat, sorry about the mouse, right? God, please, king, please have mercy on me. King looks at him and says, you know what? Feeling pretty good today. I'm going to erase that debt. I'm going to cancel your debts go i'm done with you well the guy goes out if you know the story he's thinking man who owes me money he goes out and he finds a guy that owes him a hundred denarii a hundred denarii that's like three bucks that's like three bucks the bible says he took his hands he put them on his throat and began to choke the guy he says man you owe me money give me my three bucks the guy didn't have it he had the guy thrown in prison thrown in jail for three bucks well what happened when the king himself found out what this servant had done the story ends with these verses it says then the master called the servant in you wicked servant he said i canceled all that debt of yours because you begged me to shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as i had on you in anger his master handed him over to the jailers to be tortured and so he should pay back all he owed 
This is how my heavenly Father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother or sister from your heart. Third story is about me. I'm in college. Uh, we're part of a Baptist student union, Baptist campus ministry thing, and occasionally they would take us and they would send us out to a church, maybe to fill in for a service. And so on this particular Sunday, I was going to go speak at this church, and there was a girl with me. Her name was Tara. Tara was going to go sing, so we're going to lead worship and lead the service for this little country church outside Edmond, Oklahoma. All excited, we left off that Sunday morning. We're driving to this church, back country roads, goes like this, kind of out in Oklahoma. And as we're driving, radio's cranked, having fun, excited about what we get to do. God was behind me with little flashing lights. God pulled me over and got out of the car in God's uniform. This guy walks up to me and says, wow, son, are you in a hurry or what? Where are you going this morning? I'm like, well, we're, we're going to church. I'm going to speak at this church, and she's going to sing at this church right up the road here. He's like, well, do you know how fast you were going? He's like, I honestly didn't. I don't know. I have no idea, sir, how fast I was going. It's a 55 miles per hour speed zone. Son, you're driving 88 miles an hour. 88. I'm like, wow. Now, I was the kind of kid, that's it. To scare me, all you got to do is look at me wrong, and I was scared, wetting my pants. I'm done. All right, I was that scared. I was like, man, this guy's taking me to prison. Um, this is like it. And he said, you know what? He said, I tell you what, son, you look like you're pretty scared. I'll tell you what I'm going to do. He says, I'm going to forgive you today and let this be a warning. I'm going to show you a little mercy. But boy, that better be a great church service you're on the way to. And the guy let me go. Let me go. Now, I got to tell you, since that day, I do my best to drive the speeding limit. The, he put the fear of God in me. I've not had a speeding ticket my entire life. And I do my best to drive at the speed of the speed limit because I remember that day that guy had mercy on me. Now, Jesus had a brother named James. James put it this way. He says, I want you to speak and act as those who are going to be judged by the law that gives freedom. Because judgment without mercy will be shown to anyone who has not been merciful. So here's what he's saying. Mercy triumphs over judgment. When you have a chance and you have the opportunity, you have the means, you have the ability, he's saying, I want you to show mercy over judgment. Now there's another little movie it's called Evan Almighty. I don't know if you've seen it or not a few years ago. It's a little spoof off Noah's Ark. And it's kind of a goofy movie, but I love it. It's a great family movie. It's not true, but it's based on the story of Noah. And God talks to Noah, and he's telling him, I want you to do something for me. And sometimes when people think of the flood, they think, man, is God merciful? I mean, God just, he just drowned everybody. Old women, babies, he drowned them all. Are you telling me that's a loving, merciful God? Do you realize that even in God's judgment, he still shows mercy? Even when God is judging the entire world, he still got a, gave us a way of salvation. He did show mercy. He let Noah and his family live, and mankind lives on, and we're here because God is a merciful God. If you got out of bed today, you understand that God is a merciful God. And so through this story, he's trying to teach this guy about this idea of showing kindness, showing mercy to other people. So watch this little clip, and then we're going to wrap it up. Hey. Hey. What are you doing here? Just hanging out with some old friends. You knew all along, didn't you? You knew the dam was unstable. It hadn't been for the Ark, my family, the neighbors. I fought you every step of the way. Yes, but you did it. So you had nothing to do with the flood? Like where the Ark landed exactly? I gave you a little shove at the end. Sue me. <laughs> You did good, son. You changed the world. No, no, I didn't. Well, let's see. Spending time with your family, making them very happy. Gave that dog a home. Right, so? So, how do we change the world? One act of random kindness at a time. One act of random kindness. Wow. So as you leave today, I want you to have this in, in your mind. This little idea of ARK. What does it stand for? And I'm not talking about just going to be nice to people. I'm talking about as believers in Christ, we are called to show mercy to people. We are called when given the opportunity to show mercy 
instead of judgment. And so the answer is to what is mercy? Mercy is not getting the punishment you deserve. So then what is this idea of how do I show it out? I think you can remember by these three letters, A-R-K. The A stands for simply accept mercy when it's shown to you. Somebody's forgiven your debt. You don't have to pay it back. Just accept that and move on. If you've wronged somebody and they said, you know what, I forgive you, I show you mercy, well, then you need to accept that and move on with life. And when you do that, the second one here with the R, then you are more likely to remember that mercy that you've been shown. I remember the police officer. I, don't have, I have no recollection of even the church or the service or anything that happened at that church. I don't even remember where we went. Past that point with the police officer, all I remember is this guy showing me mercy. And I carry that with me today because I remember the mercy that he has shown me. See, when we remember the mercy that other people have shown us, we are more likely to choose mercy for other people as well. And so the last one here, James tells us, I want you to keep mercy over judgment. That's it. When you get a chance to choose, if you can do either or, I want you to keep mercy over judgment. Anybody can be the judge. Anybody can pass out judgment, but not everybody can show mercy. It takes a believer in Christ who's understood what mercy means to say, you know what? I am going to show mercy in this situation. Let's pray together. Father, we do thank you for time this morning just to come and open your word. I'm thinking, God, when you're on that hillside and you say things like, blessed are those who are merciful, who show mercy. Lord, what is that about? Because they lived in a world of justice. Father, for a lot of us, that's the world we live in. We're not used to not having people pay us back or not forgiving people for what they've done or giving them a second chance. But God, the truth is you want us to be people of mercy. You want us to show mercy when we have the opportunity. So Father, I'm thankful, God, that you, you are the judge and there's going to come a day where every knee will bow, every tongue confess. Lord, you don't let everything slide. You are the final judge. You are justice. But God, you also are a God of mercy. And the fact that we get out of bed tells us that your mercies are new every morning. So, Father, we are thankful for the mercy that you've shown us when Jesus Christ died on that cross and when he took our punishment. And, God, when we make mistakes, that you still show us mercy. Now, Father, I pray that we will go forth and live that out the best that we can. So we give you thanks in advance. We just want to say that we love you and we want to live for you alone. Thank you, Jesus. Amen.